So in fact, it's wonderful to have Ava here. Um, my unit is looking and kind of using Alvar Alto as a sort of sound box this year. And if there was one person probably above all others that not only I, but the students wanted to come this year to talk about Alvar Alto with them, it was Ava. So Ava very, very kindly agreed to come to the AA, spend about 48 hours with us, um, give a seminar last night to our students, give a bigger lecture to them and to all of you today, and then to come back this afternoon for more <laughs> with our students again. For that, I'm extremely grateful, Ava. Ava, as we were talking about last night, um, many, most of you will know that all of us here on the academic staff are on one-year contracts. Um, Ava said to me that she was absolutely delighted to say that she had tenure now at Yale, so she was going nowhere, and it was going to enable her to do an array of extraordinary projects that maybe she wouldn't have been able to do without that position. So she's just recently received her tenure at Yale, um, so she will be a permanent member of the staff there now moving forward, and projects like the one she's going to talk about today, but many others that we were talking about last night that are actually much wider and far more, I, I think, ever more creative and exploratory in their nature are projects that she's going to embark upon now for about the next five to ten years. Um, I might let her say a little bit about that at the end, but I want to say no more, Ava, and pass it over to you and say welcome again. Thank you. Everybody is so far away. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I feel a little lonely, but you'll stay with me, Chris. You'll stay. Um, so thank you for inviting me, and uh, I know very well that I think uh, the, uh, the Brits have always had a particular love affair with Alto and Finn, Finland, and Finn, uh, Finn, and a great many scholars, Alto scholars in this this country. Some of which I understand have come to the seminar as well. So I, I'll, my lecture is based on my book, who, which came out uh, 2009, Alvar Alto: Architecture, Modernity, and Geopolitics. And I have actually a funny story about the. The cover, as you can tell, geopolitics above. Well, geo and politics. Um, on the bottom, you actually see Alvar Alto with uh, his uh, first wife, Aino Alto, uh, during the Second World War, when they were van uh, working for the for the for the for the planning office. And it was funny when I proposed this cover, um, the German distributor said. I cannot sell a book with the Nazi on the cover. So this is not a Nazi uniform, this is a Finnish uh, military uniform, but it already tells the story that I'm going to elaborate on, meaning that Alto was very involved uh, with geopolitics and even with Finnish national politics throughout his uh, career. But let me begin. Uh, indeed, you probably all know two things about Aalto. He, we know that he was a Finn, and we know that he liked curvy forms. Uh, he's somebody who really is associated with these two qualities. And it has raised the interesting methodological problem with, for all Aalto scholars, how to make a link between a geographic location of an architect um, and uh, he saw her architecture, in this case, even with the particular form. So I will elaborate in my lecture this, how I made this connect, how I try to make this connection. Uh, and I will argue that the curvilinear form, this is really a lecture about the curvilinear form, uh, kind of, a, it was a totally brilliant governor of very complex set of Geo geographical and geopolitical narratives that actually changed in time. It's not like it's fixed to one meaning, one moment, but it has a very complex uh, history uh, throughout Alto's career. And needless to say that I find the, the kind of uh, idea of a genius loci, the idea that there's some sort of mystical mythical essence, Finnish essence, that uh, is transmitted uh, through Aalto into his architecture. Uh, and this is very easy to dispute, like I said uh, already in the addressing the cover image, Aalto was very involved with, uh, uh, with trying to understand uh, uh, the connection between architecture and geography, 
And he even wrote many, many articles that bear names like this one he wrote to an American magazine architecture record uh, about Finland. He writes about Finnish homes in 1922. He writes about reconstruction in Finland um, during the war. And uh, my favorite title is Finland Wonderland that he wrote in 1950. So these are just some titles in which he tries to understand um, um, this uh, connection, and they reveal that he engaged geographic ideas and narratives and even major historical events in his writings. Um, so um, he also dealt with geographic themes in his work. I showed this yesterday to Chris's students. Uh, he was interested in the even kind of larger territorial dynamics, as you can see in this uh, regional plan from 1940. Uh, he even understood that beauty of the landscape would benefit his country. He talks about tourists visiting country and that it should appeal to them as something beautiful. Uh, he was interested in like this uh, regional plan for Kokemäki Valley uh, shows. He was interested in the distribution of Finnish goods into the global market. Uh, this was, of course, a country at this time very much uh, um, fueled by the wood industry, not the high tech as it is now, but the wood industry, which was distributed. Of course, the factories were distributed uh, into, the, into, the, uh, into the country countryside. So his main intellectual quest was th thus twofold. The discovery of Finnish national ethos, he was very interested in that question, but he was also interested in his country's relationship to other countries. And this is very important to remember about Aalto, that he, he, um, he was an internationalist at heart. He understood that it was not about, you know, it was not about isolationism or protectionism. He understood that the country, even in order to survive, has to engage other countries culturally, politically, economically. So as my title uh, of my lecture indicates, I want to place the geographic narratives in Alto's work and also in his reception within the broader terrain of geopolitics. This is a key concept, which is here used to refer to the combination of geographic and political factors influencing a country or a region. And I would argue that influenced Alto's architecture. So to be sure, when we think about 20th century, we must be reminded that all geography was politically highly charged. You can't think about 20th century without thinking about geopolitics. The century was marked by civil wars. Finland had a civil war, two world wars, and culminated in the Cold War, which only led to a new wave of nationalist and religious hatred. So this is really a the saga of 20th century, and it's very much Alto's personal story. Actually, he kind of graduated from architecture school during the Civil War, during Finnish independence uh, struggles, and then died, kind of very symbolically, <laughs> importantly, during the height of the Cold War, or at the kind of end of the Cold War. These events exposed to, hi to him, his countrymen, and many of his European colleagues to situations that were often beyond their control. Indeed, Alto's life and career evolved unpredictably in unpredictable times. Yet, and this is, uh, I want to always remind it, which is also the magic of 20th century in Alto's career, amidst all these horrors, it was a century also of social, political, and artistic experimentation. And geographic attribute came to mean many things. Alto used concepts such as internationalism, pan-Europeanism, regionalism, universalism um, as alternative political world orders to fight extreme nationalism, which Alto endorsed. So I always say that nothing could be more against, I think, what Alto and his fellow travelers of 20th century where against nothing could have been that this introverted nationalism. He was really, inter you know, and that there were many alternatives to the kind of dominant that we now think of internationalism as the only alternative. There was, for example, this 
pan-Europeanism, the more total dissolution of national boundaries, were very much put forward as an alternative. So short history lesson is in place. Aalto's home country, Finland, was in many ways a product of 20th century. Located in the contested territory between East and West, it has always been trapped in the territorial and ideological disputes of much larger, more powerful nations. The painting here on the left looms large in the Finnish national consciousness, the innocent Finnish maiden being attacked by the evil Russian eagle. The chart on the right shows how the country's eastern boundary has changed throughout history. Aalto lived through the civil war, like I said, it, which was followed by the Declaration of Independence in a, 1918. The two Finno-Russian wars between 1939 and the Cold War. Towards the end of his life, Aalto died in 1976. He also saw Finland develop into an affluent welfare state. When we consider Finland's geopolitical dilemma, the idea of Aalto being quintessentially Finnish architect gains new meaning. First, we must be reminded that internationalism and nationalism always went hand in hand. Parallel could be drawn between Finland, the country, and Aalto, the man. Their destinies depended greatly on how they managed their relationships to other countries. It is interesting to map how these transnational affinities changed in time and often in tandem, so Finland's and Aalto's. So since his graduation from architecture school in 1921, Aalto traveled frequently, almost frantically. Not least because he thought he had more in common with the educated international, not least because he thought he had more in common with the educated international elite than his countrymen. We, you know, we, we share these feelings nowadays, you know. You guys might have more friends in other cosmopolitan centers than... With, so Aalto was very much in that spirit. He was a cosmopolitan at heart. His first trips were directly directed to the neighboring Scandinavia and to Latvia countries which the new state saw as political allies. As his, his and his country's ambitions grew, he traveled to Italy, the cradle of Western civilization, as if to prove that Finland, Europe's northern and easternmost corner, belonged to the West. He made his first trip to the continent in 1928, the year Finland joined the League of Nations first to Holland and to France, and after becoming a CM delegate in 1929, uh, Switzerland also became a, uh, his, um, his, um, his uh, frequent destination in early 30s onwards, as Europe started to become succumbed to totalitarianism of many kinds. So you can tell his trips totally paralleled the kind of a you know, geopolitical scene. Aalto spent prolonged time in the U.S. during the World, World War II, even thought about emigrating, and Italy became again the chosen Valheimat after the war, a reminder of shared European values as the continent was being reborn from the ashes. So I'm actually convinced that Aalto's personality, his charisma, his likability, his ambition, even his kind of strategic calculations and larger than lifeness was, the key, was a key to his architectural achievements. People liked him wherever he went, and by 1930, at the age of 32, he was a full member of the web of architects, artists, and critics that formed the European modern movement. Quite an achievement for somebody who came from, the, from a country that very few people even knew. He was a networker par excellence. His language skills opened many doors. In addition to Finnish and Swedish, the two uh, languages that he learned at home, he was fluent in German, French, and English. He knew also some Latin, Italian, and Russian. And Demetri Porfirio told me that they spoke Greek together when he worked in the office just before Aalto died. His ability to adapt to different settings can be credited also to his personal and political malleability. There's something of a Salic in him. 
I see him as a kind of real politiker, willing to adjust his works and words to the constantly changing political landscape. He was thus a true modern man, willing to take risks, adapt, and desire to change both his life and surroundings. Aalto was indeed more political than previously given credit. He was political, and, and I don't, I want to, I, political is not being bad. It's, you know, it's a, it's a very useful ability. He was political in the most common sense of the word. He understood that social relationships are political, and he liked to prefer powerful people. So clockwise, from the top, you see him with some of his closest allies and friends. He's seen on top, he's seen with Siegfried Gideon, perhaps the most powerful man within the modern movement. Harry Gulliksen on the left, the CEO of Finland's largest corporation at that time. And then on the right hand corner, Urho Kekkonen, Finland's long standing president from 1956 to 82. His, Kekkonen is the guy with the bald head. Importantly, all these people used Aalto in various ways to realize their own geographic strategies. Gideon, Aalto's main mentor in the international area, by using Aalto's architecture to prove, he, prove his own synthetic, synthetic position based on healthy balance between internationalism and nationalism. Gullik Shen, one of Aalto's main clients during the 1930s and 40s, commissioned Aalto to design several factories and regional plants based on his ideal of industrialized and export-orientated country. And Kekkonen, who is here seen in front of Aalto's plan for the central Helsinki, commissioned by the state, by using Aalto's architecture to convey an image of neutral, peace-loving nation during the height of the Cold War. Aalto was indeed more political than previously given credit. He was political in the most common sense of the word. No, I, I read that. Um, so in what follows, I will show how Aalto communicated his own political affinities and so social aspirations through architecture. So many of my examples are uh, small temporary structures often highlight an aspect of a well-known building. Each of them reveals different geographic narratives and uh, strategy. And I want to, like I said, focus on the use of curvilinear form. Um, and I will argue that uh, when it arrives in Alto's architecture in the early 30s, it marks the shift from geographic to geopolitical. Meanings become more ambiguous and unpredictable, reflective of Finland's geopolitical dilemma. But first I want to talk about his early work, where meanings are still pretty stable. So this is one of the very first structures that Aalto did for the National Fair in 1922, exemplifies this sort of static semantic strategy. Um, Aalto was at this time a well-versed historist who believed that architecture could communicate cultural values, even political ideas. Architecture was conceived as a coded language, architecture as a narrator. What is particularly striking about this example is that Aalto, who was not particularly keen on Finnish vernacular architecture at this point, chooses a vernacular motive, a thatched roof, which does not appear in the Finnish vernacular lexicon. This choice can hardly be understood without knowledge of contemporaneous political situation. Aalto had certainly seen such buildings when traveling through southern Sweden and Denmark. They could also be found in the region of Ingria, um, around St. Petersburg, which local population, the Ingrians, Ingerilized, as in Finnish, were Finnish speakers and Lutheran. The thatched roof made thus a case for cultural and political alliances within the Baltic region. The second example is from the same year. It is an entrance pavilion for an annual national singing festival, a very popular event, which goal was to reinforce national unity. This modest structure exemplifies Aalto's ideas about how to appropriate foreign architectural motives and styles. Note how unabashedly he reveals the rough construction of this temporary structure, its bare bone moldings, its ornamentation, the way the birch trees, can you see the birch trees poking through the structure? 
and windows reveal Alto's sense of humor as well as his thinking about how forms circulate, gaining unexpected effects and meanings as they get appropriated in new context. He did not shun away from the fact that cultural imports can lead to conflicts, get misappropriated, even misunderstood. The third example is a rendering of his Turun Sanomat headquarters designed shortly after he had completed his first trip to the continent in 1928 and was obviously influenced by the international style architecture. I want to draw your attention to how the building appropriated electric light and media. The former had a particular significance since the country was being electrified at this same, same time, a major step towards modernization. The architect saw himself no uh, the architect saw himself no longer as an editor of cultural influence, but as the rendering shows, willing remade his building into an information machine. A passerby was able to gain access to culture and information from all around the world. He actually used projections um, to to um, to depict the first pages of the of the newspaper. His, um, his interest is how images circulate an awareness of their impact marks a significant shift in Alto's thinking about architecture's use as a political tool in the age of mass media. The third example I showed this yesterday to the students uh, shows an entrance sequence to the Turku exhibition which took place in 1929. It's Alto's kind of first, uh, uh, first um, modern, uh, modernist design. Note how the crowds get funneled through the slightly inclined plaza, past the ticket booth towards the larger stair. The orchestrated movement was accompanied by the rhythmic, rhythmic staccato of the kiosks. Architecture equals here a social diagram, which celebrates the experience of being part of the urban mass, a tool of mass psychology. Every architectural element ap amplified this psychological effect. This was, of course, suddenly realizing that modern architecture can be used towards, you know, creating kind of sense of uh, also a national um, body, collective body of people. Um, my next example is a set design. Like I said, these are all smaller projects, lesser known projects, um, of an anti war play entitled SOS. Uh, lit, written by a pioneering Finnish modernist, um, and who was a member of Clarté, an organization founded by the French author Henri Barbus during the First World War to promote peace in the wake of the First World War. Can you see the world? You see the world Pan Europa painted on the floor, endorsed Barbus's idea of borderless Europe, a more radical alternative to internationalism which left national boundaries intact. This was a big debate in Europe at the time, whether to keep the boundaries and form international organizations to cover their relationship, or just to let it all, all loose uh, and allow the total freedom of mobility of people, etc. Something closer to the European Union. The formal rupture, created by the fragmented planes and randomly ordered words, aimed at producing similar mental and and social rupture in the audience. Alto's architecture starts to gain international attention in 1930. Two publications, and bo actually both also in, the, in, in his own country, two publications exemplify how different audiences interpreted the essence of a single building, the Turun Sanomat headquarters. The Finnish modernist literary magazine Tulenkantaja chooses the backside of the building for its cover, a particularly nondescript viewpoint lacking any information about the site or tectonic details. The text in the upper right-hand corner declares, all European nations are one. To service this goal, the image suggested architecture should be matter of fact without any sentimental attachment to place or material effects. It is interesting to compare this interpretation to the one put forward in Philip Johnson and Henry Ra Ra Russell Hitchcock in their book International Style Architecture since 22. The chosen photograph depicted the massive sculptural columns in the basement. The caption eliminated all geopolitical subtext, subtext which fueled the European modern movement 
and emphasize the form-giving process of the creator. They write, industrial building raised to the level of architecture by fine proportions, smooth surfaces, and carefully studied forms. So this brings us to the curvilinear form, which proved a particularly versatile governing uh, in governing multiple meanings throughout different times and different contexts. The form emerged in Alto's work in around 1930, presumably through Alto's material studies in wood. In this publicity shot from early 30s, Alto is portrayed in front of one of them. Since then, the form has been considered Alto's signature motifs. Yet, I would argue that the form cannot be separated from the complex political subtext that motivated its genesis, reception, and its appropriation. The prevailing assumption is that the emergence of curvilinear form in Alto's work signaled his distance taking from international modernism. Furthermore, the form is considered a true expression of natu his national origins and often linked to the image of Finland as a place of flowing rivers and rolling hills. Indeed, the impetus for this kind of form making can be traced to Alto's exposure, in contrast, I would say, to Alto's exposure to German architectural debates surrounding Bauhaus, particularly his friendship to Mahorinage, and ideas about formal experimentation. There's the rolling hills, there's Alto with Mahorinage. And, um, uh, who, uh, who Alto visits Bauhaus at this time and sees the materials experimentation done by Mahali students. And in fact, the process, how Alto narrates the process of form giving uh, mimics, uh, very much that, that Alto uh, Mahalinaj teaches, taught his students at the Bauhaus. The process starts, he demonstrates, um, with the raw material, with its inherent structure and form. The next step introduced bending as external lending um, and lends uh, the form a new texture. And the final product, a stool, um, table stool or a um, um, uh, table or stool leg, indexed the mechanical process, in this case lamination and pressing. Mahali understood architecture and human life similarly, a process and emergence. A lecture Alto gave in 1935 entitled Rationalism and Man revealed the influence of this biocentric worldview. He writes, nature has rich and luxurious forms with the same construction, the same tissue, and the same principles of cellular organization. It can create millions of combinations, each of which represents a definite, highly developed form. Man li man's life belongs to the same category. The things that surround him are highly fetishes or allegorical with mystical eternal value. More than everything, anything else, they are cells and tissues, living beings like himself, building components that constitute human life. So you see what is happening with the, suddenly starts to think, th think of form very differently. You know, it doesn't have, it's part, you know, it has this sort of emergence. It has this sort of uh, changing, malleable, amorphous quality very different from this idea of that we have form that designates meaning, a fixed semantic meaning. It's a total different way of thinking of also about, about meaning. It is also um, hard to ignore that Alto's forms greatly resemble Sean Arp's wood reliefs that Sigrid Gideon's wife, the famous art historian Carola Gideon Welker, uh, was the first most authority of. Arp referred to his biomorphic form. You see actually Alto on the left and Arp on the right, basically like one year distance between the two. The two had met uh, at Gideon's home. Alto referred to his biomorphic form making as configuration, constellation, and construction, which emphasized the gathering of disparate elements to form a whole. Gideon Welke considered Arp's work as, quote, pure poetry, which allows everything anecdotal and specific, as well as psychological and individual, to flow into one large reservoir. I find this, again, the interesting, the idea that form is something that evolves, something that merges different influences, different experiences. Again, a very different from idea of a, uh, a fixed meaning. 
Siegfried Gideon gave Arp's forms a geopolitical reading in 1930, making a case that the most promising new art came from small countries like Alsace, where Jean Arp was formed from, which, quote, due to its location between German and French culture, is able to take a relatively free approach. So this is again, so they, they talk about ambiguity, they talk about multiple forces rather than fixed meaning. So Gideon makes this very interesting link that, that this form, this type of architecture um, and art is something that's not fixed in meaning and it's also produced by people who don't represent a kind of strong national um, ideology or essence. You know, Jean Arp was great because he was neither French or German. He was in between. Alto, he, Gideon calls Alto later a Randstad, the border country, that it's a kind of between East and West. It has a kind of a weak identity, you know, in some way to say. So Gideon uh, starts to play, uh, um, to pay attention to Alto and Finland around the same, t uh, same time. Um, his first article entitled on Finnish architecture came out in 1931. Like I said earlier, interestingly, he fo it focuses more on its native country than his architecture, calling Finland a Randstad, a border state, a country still in a state of becoming. Gideon was very fascinated that uh, Finland is somehow very raw, that it, has, it doesn't have the strong identity of a German or a Brit, you know, that it's a, it's a weak and it was great. So both politically, culturally, um, it, and it was a fortunate state of affair, considering that overdeveloped national identity was being becoming a huge problem in Europe. Gideon's interest intensifies in 1933, the year Hitler came to power. After visiting the 1933 Milan Triennale, he writes to Alto himself, he writes actually in a review, he says, Alto's wooden chairs represented one of the few cheering prospects in the international section. And in August 1933, he sends Alto this postcard in which he makes the following prediction. You see it in the, in the middle of the, um, the, 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 the writing. He writes, you might one day become the magician of the North. So this is the moment that Gideon has decided that this is the Alto represents the future of the modern movement. In the end of his card, Gideon reminds Alto of, of coming to see a meeting during which the participants were to travel from Marseille to Athens and back on a boat. Alto ends up attending only the return leg of the journey. And in retrospect, this is a very interesting moment. So you have to understand this is a, Alto just emerging, having built his first buildings, having started to done their furniture, and at the same time, a lot of European architects, Hitler coming to power, um, the, basically the constructivist uh, experiment is over in Russia, a lot of uh, German modernists start to flee the country. So it's kind of like the swan song, and Alto is the kind of only hope, you know, only hope that there is in sight. Um, and it's interesting also that they are on the boat, so they are not in Germany, they are not in Finland, they are not in Britain, they are kind of in this sort of in-between land. They are on a boat, floating and dreaming. Uh, and uh, many of the people who were on the boat, they, they celebrated the idea that, that everybody, all the nationalities were on this boat. It was like a Noah's Ark. You know, all the nationalities kind of merging into this sort of sea of humanity. And uh, Mahali Nash, I will show a little film clip, I hope it works. Mahali Nash is recording, captures the atmosphere on the boat. And Alto appears, it's important also, very prominently on the film. And this is the, this is the highlight, Alto sleeping on the boat, on the deck. This is Alto sleeping. Alto on the right. Alto on the here. Uh, 
I don't know who this guy is. This is interesting. So you see, uh, like obviously here, but then the camera turns to alto, and then it's the end. So alto. Uh, um, so the, I find this image of alto sleeping. How many images of architects sleeping have you seen? In, this is probably the first one. I bet it's the first one. I find this idea that Gideon, uh, uh, Mahalinaus invests in this film, the, alto, the sleeping alto, particularly endearing and symbolic in its ability to capture the dilemma of 20th century architect. How to dream when the world is falling apart. Um, and uh, emblematically, the last silhouette, like I showed, after the camera moves away from Corbusier belongs to Alto. So even this kind of a, a silhouette, so kind of a ghost-like, uh, you know, a dreamy, dreamy figure. So the Carvilinear car form captures this convergence of dream and reality as a form that was originally conceived as a diagram of constantly evolving quasi-biological condition uh, and starts to migrate into practical uses. It's first morph, um, metamorphosed into acoustic ceiling, then into a vase, finally becoming complete buildings even. And the, so the form proved to be laden with open-ended functional, procedural, and representational ramifications. These images suggest that even the vase can be read alternatively as a figurative, Figurative symbol, he actually, this is the first sketch where he calls them Eskimo woman's breeches. You know, those things that you put on your legs to protect from show. Sometimes he depicts as kind of a pure automatic uh, drawing, formal play. Or you can read it as a functional object. And I think this is something that prov you know, makes people so difficult to understand architecture that you can, you, can, you can continue arguing, is it functional form? Is it just form for form's sake? So does it have some symbolic meaning? And I think it's fascinating to think that he was able to invest all these different things uh, in one, one form. You know, this is a typical example. You know, he can even himself provide drawings like that. But when you look at that, you can clearly see that this is just not a functional acoustic, uh, that they has, there is a more of a kind of, um, you know, multiple things going on at the, at the same time. So at this point, in, uh, somewhere around uh, late 30s, uh, the form starts also to govern Finland's and Aalto's international image in an equally ambis ambiguous manner. Indeed, at this point, it becomes impossible to separate between the form and its reception. This is um, actually a so it is interesting to, um, to um, trace what meanings the formal trope gains in different contexts. So this is the Finnish pavilion at the Paris World's Fair in 1937, which you see here is tucked in the woods next to the Palais Chaillot behind the imposing German and Russian, uh, Rush, Russian pavilion. So here in the, in the front you see the the face-off between Russia and uh, you know, the monumental expression, Albert Speer, um, and um, um, the, the, the <laughs> Russian architect's pavilion, uh, very imposing. And Alto is here. Tucked into the woods, you never see the context, but that's the, the context. That's the, that's the co context. Um, it featured Alto's furniture, um, but also this air, air, aerial view of Finnish lake landscapes, kind of similar to what I showed in the beginning. Can you see it on the right of the pavilion? Um, the image of continuous, here's a close-up of that image. The image of the continuous amorphous matrix, half water, half land, added another layer of meaning to the curvilinear form. Finnish nature and culture were presented as biological narratives, free from any ideological or political disputes that eventually led to the, to the Second World War. So very interesting kind of crafting of meaning. You know, we compare this to the monumental expression of the German. So, you know, Aalto was very interested in crafting uh, uh, and knew that these world exhibitions were very uh, important venues to craft uh, political meaning. Uh, 
visit to the Altos Pavilion prompted the curators of the Museum of Modern Art in New York to single out Alto for retrospective on the spot. The exhibition titled Altos Architecture and Furniture took place the following year, was put together in a kind of state of urgency. Significantly, it was the first major retrospective that MoMA had for any architects. There had been a smaller one for Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright, but Alto was really the guy of the MoMA. This is something that has been kind of forgotten, but clearly the people at MoMA knew that at this political moment, you know, we want to highlight, highlight this guy. Um, so the catalog reveals what meaning and significance Americans saw in Alto's preferred formal trope. What MoMA called the organic form was considered an arbiter of post-international style architecture, a sign of more national and personal approach, most importantly personal. It is noteworthy that the furniture actually gained more press than his architecture. I think the architecture kind of looked a little bit too international style, but the furniture is something that they always uh, uh, recognize. After this critical triumph, it comes as no surprise that the curvilinear form takes over the Finnish pavilion in the New York World's Fair the following year. The installation was dominated by the inclined wooden display, which integrated as, uh, all aspects of the show into a single powerful image. You can see pictures of Finnish industry and landscape, and you see on the lower part, you see different products from wooden skis, and et cetera, et cetera. At this point, Alto seems completely aware that certain ambiguity of meaning was beneficial to the country at the eve of the Second World War. He writes, quote, a true image of the country cannot be conveyed with individual objects alone. It can done, be done convincingly only by the atmosphere such objects create together. That is, only by the overall effect perceived by the senses. I mean, now we talk about affect, you know, other atmosphere rather than meaning. Very important. Not a single thing, but this sort of a symphony of meaning. Alto's representational strategy was carefully crafted, displaying objects in a state of becoming. Again, not fixed meanings, but ambiguity, evolving, becoming, endlessly repeating the undula undulating line in all scales. The outcome was what Roland Bard has called the reality effect, marked by overabundance of details and information without a coherent narrative. Very clever guy. You can see this incredible kind of symphony of effects. Um, the emphasis on elusive atmosphere helped to communicate the presumably non-ideological constructive ethos of Finland as the exhibition opened for its second session in 19, April 1940, shortly after the end of the Winter War. Information about the scope of destruction and reconstruction effort was added. Alto reinforced the reading of Finns being a nation without political agenda in his frequent appearances in American media. This is a quote, the Finns are a nation of builders. We will probably have to build and fight at the same time. So building, a uh, very important, again, this sort of open-ended constructive. An article named simply Finland, which Alto wrote for Architectural Forum the following year, following summer, continued to distance Finnish architecture from any ideological constraints. The aerial view here is, is here used to prove that Finlanders poor geography without ideology. True Finns, Finnish modern architecture, which probably included his own, had presumably nothing to do with the superficial international style, but was, but was based on, quote, how the country itself, its climate, resources, topography, and ways of living. In a letter to Frank Lloyd Wright, aiming to gain his support for the Finnish war effort, Alto even dismissed the idea of nation as obsolete. He writes, quote, I hope that this will confirm you, co confirm to you the idea that this battle is our common, for the na not for the nation, that is an obsolete idea, but a battle for constructive will and constructive knowledge which, which exist in all of us everywhere in the West. 
So Siegfried Gideon's Alto chapter in Space, Time and Architecture from 1949 originated from this historical context. He wrote the first chapter after hearing Alto speak about Finnish rec reconstruction in Swin uh, Switzerland during the war. And the chapter includes this page which juxtaposes Finnish lake landscape, um, which at this point had become a metonym for Finland, his vases and the plan of the New York pavilion. The compulsive repetition of the curvilinear form was echoed in Gideon's statement, Finland is wherever Aalto goes. The obsession with Finland went hand in hand to the obsession of curvilinear form. I wrote an article for the AA files about this. It's this idea that somehow there's a sort of continuous topology of Aalto, the man and the form and the history and everything kind of weaves in and out, um, 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 sharing the same common uh, destiny. The undulating line enjoys a new coming during the Cold War when it becomes heralded as the free form. You heard about that. A highly ideological concept put forward by the Museum of Modern Art. Aalto starts gaining commissions from other countries shortly after the war. Understandably, the first commission comes from the US, which sees itself as a champion of the free world. The Baker House dormitory uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the MIT campus, it too um, kind of navigates between the fun functional and symbolic readings. And West Germany, faced with the humongous task of inventing, reinventing itself both politically and culturally, commissioned several buildings from Alto, including the Hansa Viertel housing block in West Berlin, built in the late 50s. The covered area between the two towers, decorated by this biomorphic form, became a potent metaphor for all new boundaries that had been drawn in Europe. I always think, doesn't this look like a kind of Stasi spy, the guy with the, with the, with the briefcase in the, in the back? Alto was particularly loved in war-torn Italy, from where he received many commissions, several from the Olivetti family although only one was built. An unbuilt proposal for a housing area in Pavia, you see, can see this plan for a, this sort of slab, undulating left building, uh, a slab building, consisted of, of these um, uh, things. Leonardo Mosso, Alto's design associate on the project, called it a synchronic lattice, able to host multiple, even spontaneous programs and activities. Italian critics heralded Alto's architecture as being grounded in real life problems while being poetic enough to trigger imagination. This sort of open-ended, uh, open-endedness was the key. Uh, writing in 1958, issue of Zodiac devoted to Alto. Zodiac is a very important post-war Italian magazine. The painter and critic Pier Can Carlo Santilli uh, might have ha um, uh, writes very beautifully about this sort of ambiguity in architecture. I think it's the one of the very be most beautiful se <laughs> words said about Alto's architecture. He talks about the feeling of space liberated and controlled by form. It's wonderful, this idea, liberated and controlled. That Again, the ambiguity. And he continues, he says, with what does it rhyme, this strange architecture that escapes any classification in its ultimate greatness? With what indeed, if not beauty nowadays so oft wronged, so oft denied in man's life? So it becomes this sort of, um, again, ambiguous, the je ne sais quoi of architecture. In his native Finland, Aalto became the de facto state architect, gaining numerous large commissions. The Finlandia House, the last building to be completed in his lifetime, can be singled out as the most potent symbol. The building was completed to house, actually, the European Security Summit, which took place in 1967, with the goal to end the Cold War. So it's actually interesting that in the last career, if these things come together, he's actually, his architecture is to house this important international summit. He uses Gerald Ford addressing the summit. The building made the host country appear as a gentle guardian of Western values, a quasi-neutral quasi mediator between two ideological camps. Of course, the, the true story of Finland's position in the Cold War was much more complex. 
So this slide summarizes my argument. Altos architecture must be understood within the complex web of individual actors, discourse, geography, society, politics, and power. I show, I try to map out the different readings, the different dates, and the different kind of uses of this, this curvilinear form and how it gains different readings and different meanings in this different context. Again, to conclude, Aldo's life and career developed unpredictably in unpredictable times, and the story is not over yet. Now the country's main function is, of course, to sell goods. Aldo has proven to be a particularly marketable brand. Design stores and websites around the world help to disseminate Aldo's designed objects more widely than ever. The vase alone is sown, uh, sold in 50 countries, and it is the most budget-friendly way to possess a piece of Alto magic, but it's quite expensive. It's still $145 at the MoMA store. I would just suggest that the vase has already surpassed the Finnish maiden as the most powerful image of Finnish national consciousness. The recent cover of a literary magazine, Nuori Voima, suggests that it has actually become Finland. You can see the different towns in Finland uh, and look at the map. And this is uh, my last slides, the winning entry by Druk for the design competition on climate change. It took place in 2007. It proves my thesis that Aalto was a master of image management. It can be applied to anything that is good and ethical. Uh, it's a brilliant design. You probably know the story. Uh, it has the timeline of the two lakes. There's the 1937 vision with the big, big lake, and then the shrunken lake due to the climatic change in 2007, and uh, the new vase kind of merges the two, two things. I end my, um, um, and this uh, ends my, ends my, end, ends my lecture. So the story is still evolving now in the kind of uh, uh, state of uh, the global alto, the globalization version of uh, alto, but. Uh, uh, but like I said, Alto um, was a master of uh, image management. I think that could be the concluding, concluding statement. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Ava? There might be a mic too. Is that right? You'll wander around if you've got any questions. It's actually interesting to think that 20, you know, the 20th century, this whole, the, all this history, has it been forgotten? I wonder. Uh, I was going to, yeah. I was going to, I was intrigued by the, your final image. Yeah. We had a guy named Harry Charrington come talk to the students. You also write yeah, about yeah. the other day. Where Ava finishes her lecture with a kind of vase image, but becoming landscape in a way. Yeah. Harry started his where he'd been at a dinner party, and all the biscuits were in the shape of Alto Vaz. So this kind of, I mean, for our yeah. students in a way, and I think there have been other examples through this lecture series yeah. of the kind of pervasiveness yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, that this image has achieved. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. It, not only in Finland, obviously, but in the Everywhere, yeah. It's yeah. just ex extraordinary. Extraordinary for architecture to do, yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, I recently uh, heard this brilliant lecture about, uh, about um, from uh, this guy called David Joselit, who is, uh, writes about contemporary art, he talked about the multiplicity of images, you know? And Alto is in a way you can't understand him without, you know, that it's the meaning is created by the multiplicity of the image rather than the singularity of the image. It's kind of a fascinating to think about it that way. I think also there's a trickiness or a twist, which I've never, I mean, maybe yeah. you can confirm or deny for me. It's my understanding that Sweden bought Arte in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. And as someone that I know said, uh, the, the Finns couldn't sell anything. So it wasn't until the 90s that Arte was sold to the Swedes yeah. that actually the Alto Bonds really began to sell. So that yeah. all of a sudden it's kind of selling it to the Swedes, you know, opening it up in a way. That now, as yeah. a Finnish person, would you agree, Eva? I think they sold a lot. I, I, I don't know. This is the little late I have to think about that. Right. Yeah. Someone suggested to yeah. me that, in fact, this, this kind of yeah. you know, new kind of uh, 
I, yeah. I get a kind of rejuvenation of Alto fruit. This yeah. is just this single form. Exactly, yeah. It, what was suggested to me, it was down to the sweets more than the fins, actually. Yeah, but that kind of fits the story perfectly. You know, it just kind of migrates, it continues its migration, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think one part of um, Alto was always that people did, uh, you know, like all the critics they made, you know, there was something in him that was uh, not divided in ideological camps. Like everybody loved, uh, loved him. Everybody mm -hmm. interpreted him in different ways, that there's something kind of open-ended and pervasive, you know? about the, the architecture, you know? It's so I think the story of, it's, it's a story of a circulation of image, meaning, uh, multiple, you know, so I think that is the other story, you know, uh, very much. And that makes, of course, him very, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny combination that it's so, it's kind of easy architecture. There's something that you can kind of, everybody can kind of understand and feel for, but at the same time, it's very difficult to pinpoint, you know? you can't pinpoint in single meaning, single, you know, that there's something pervasive, but, uh, yeah. but ever so difficult to emulate or to, you know, to understand. Elusive. Does anyone have any questions or is it lunchtime? I went over 50 minutes, I think. No, yeah. right. Lunch. Ava, thank you very, yeah. very much. Welcome. Yeah.